Julia Mangan and Lon Chaney weren't acquainted. In fact, the two never came into contact with each other during their lifetimes. Nevertheless, when Mangan was murdered, Cheney's was a name uttered at the trial even more than the defendant's. Even today, you can't find anything online about Julia Mangan's life without Lon Chaney's name also coming up. A person whose on-screen face her assailant claimed had driven him insane. This week on Out of the Past, the murder of Julia Mangan. On the night of October 23rd, 1928, near the north entrance of London's Hyde Park, Robert Williams, a 28-year-old unemployed Welsh carpenter, was discovered on the ground by a policeman on patrol. Williams was bleeding profusely from the neck and had a razor blade beside him. The policeman knelt down to help him and heard the chilling words, I did it. She has been teasing me. The confused officer followed William's finger with his eyes and was horrified to see the limp, unconscious body of a young woman. It didn't take long to see that Julia Mangan, an Irish domestic servant slash waitress who lived or possibly just worked in Stanhope Gardens in nearby South Kensington, was in much worse shape than Williams. He was able to speak, whereas she lay there bleeding out onto the fashionable glove with which she was clutching her neck wound. The medical examiner would later state that Williams had to have had a lot of pent-up anger towards Julia to attack her so brutally. They rushed her to the hospital where she died the next day. Julia Mangan was only 21 years old. At first, it looked like Williams might meet the same fate, but once it became clear that he would recover, a clearer picture began to form of what happened. It emerged that Mangan and Williams weren't strangers. According to Julia's brother Patrick, the two had been seeing each other for three or four weeks. Williams had behavior problems, and Patrick, who never cared for him, reported that he had forcibly removed him from Julia's home at one point, when his drunken antics got out of control. Williams told the court that he'd been seeing Julia for about a month, and over the course of that month, his mental health began to deteriorate. For three days before the crime, Williams admitted he had carried around a razor blade, prepared to use it to end his own life. He claimed that he had never intended to hurt Julia. He adored her and wanted to marry her, though for an unexplained reason he had used a false name when he first met her. Williams was charged with murder and attempted suicide, and this case was tried twice. First in the Marlborough Police Court, at which time the jury was unable to reach a verdict. Then a couple of months later at the Old Bailey Courthouse. Over the course of two trials, the defense argued that Williams, like other members of his family, suffered from mental illness. A chaplain from his hometown was brought in to validate this claim. A London doctor who examined Williams testified that he suffered from neurasthenia and that he would classify him as abnormal, but not insane. Dr. James Cowan Woods, an expert who was often called upon in criminal cases, testified that Williams murdered Mangan in a state of epileptic automatism. For years, people have argued that this isn't even a thing, and the notion is actually offensive to people with epilepsy. Epilepsy is a controllable disease. The judge found the suggestion just as foolish as any rational person would today. You have said that many people of high intelligence are going about their work, although they are suffering from epilepsy. Are you suggesting that they might commit murder tomorrow? In truth, it's not clear from the available records that Williams was ever actually confirmed to be epileptic. On Williams' own account, he had attacked Mangan in a sudden state of delirium, which precipitated his alleged epileptic fit. He testified that around 10 in the evening that night in Hyde Park, he had proposed to her. We don't know whether she accepted or refused his offer of marriage. She did tell him that he needed to stop drinking, 
but it's not clear whether that was earlier in the conversation or in direct response to his proposal. The last thing he claimed to remember before losing touch with reality, and then waking up in the hospital where a nurse was washing his feet, was a dreadful hallucination. First, he reported, he heard Julia whistling. And then, he lost it. I felt as though my head were going to burst and that steam was coming out of both sides. All sorts of things came to my mind. I thought a man had me in a corner and was pulling faces at me. He threatened and shouted at me that he had me where he wanted me. The man pulling faces was Lon Chaney, all done up in his makeup for London after midnight. Lon Chaney, remembered as the Man of a Thousand Faces, was a skilled actor and makeup artist who got his start in vaudeville around the turn of the century and made his fame in the silent film industry. Back in those days, many actors didn't wear makeup on camera, or if they did, they were responsible for applying it themselves. Lon Chaney was an artist and made it his mission in life to transform himself into the most grotesque characters film audiences had ever seen. He was always experimenting with different kinds of makeup. Some of these cosmetics were so dangerous they put him in the hospital. In 1927, director Todd Browning, who would go on to make Dracula and Freaks, cast Chaney in a production called London After Midnight. Cheney played several different roles, the most disturbing of which was the man in the beaver hat. For this costume, he transformed himself into a ghoul. He looked terrifying with his hypnotic eyes and sharpened teeth. Though the film met with lukewarm reviews, it was a box office hit, and some viewers had a hard time shaking particular images from their heads. Even Justice Travers Humphreys, who presided over William's second trial, acknowledged the power of the images that Cheney created. I do not know whether you have been to see any film in which he acted. One of them, we are told, is The Hunchback of Notre Dame, and another, London After Midnight. If any of you members of the jury have seen the latter, or even the advertisements of what Mr. Lon Cheney looks like when he is acting in that film, you may agree it is enough to terrify anybody. If the accused saw that film, you may not think it remarkable or as in any way indicating insanity that he should in a moment of emotional excitement remember the horrifying, terrible aspect of an actor in a part in which he was purposely being terrible. I can myself see nothing in the vision to suggest that the accused is an epileptic. After all that, Williams was found guilty and sentenced to death. But his sentence was commuted by the Home Secretary. William Joynson Hicks, Viscount Brentford, and he was sent to the Broadmoor Criminal Lunatic Asylum. How long William stayed in the asylum and whether he was ever released are things we'll probably never know. The answers have been lost to time. It's noteworthy that it has been almost a century since this crime has been committed, and though it's quite common for people to blame the media for violence in society, this is one of the few cases in which the murderer themselves has blamed a fictional horror character for their actions. And I don't mean copycat killers or crimes inspired by horror movies. I mean people who thought that horror characters were real, and then that was used in their defense. I only know a couple of cases like this. If you know any more, please share in the comments. In 1982, a California handyman named Richard Delmer Boyer murdered an elderly Fullerton couple, Francis and Eileen Harbitz, after going to their house to ask to borrow money to pay off a drug debt. Boyer was strung out on several drugs at the time, including cocaine, PCP, and alcohol. He noticed a wallet sitting on their dresser, at which point, in his own words, he started just freaking out. He started hallucinating. He saw a foggy figure in the hallway holding a knife. The figure, he said, was Michael Myers, the masked slasher from the Halloween movies. Boyer blacked out and when he came to, the Harbitzes were dead. The film fiend, he said, just took over. His insanity plea failed and he was sentenced to death. 
He remains on death row to this day. Perhaps the only case in which a similar insanity defense has been effective is the widely publicized Slender Man stabbing of 2014, in which two middle school girls lured the third member of their friend trio into the woods, where they stabbed her repeatedly in an attempt to kill her, saying that they did it to appease the fictional character Slender Man, a giant, skeletal, creepypasta character intended to scare online readers. The victim survived, and the assailants were both sent to mental institutions. The psychology behind this case is addressed at length in the 2016 HBO documentary, Beware the Slender Man. I think there are probably a lot of psychological similarities between Robert Williams' The Halloween Killer and the girls who were involved with the Slender Man stabbing. I don't believe that Williams was an epileptic, as one doctor said, nor do I think he was abnormal but not insane, as another doctor put it. I think that Williams was dealing with psychological issues that they didn't know how to treat or recognize at the time. Mental health is everything. Williams said he had been carrying that razor blade around for days because he was suicidal. Perhaps if he had had a better support system and treatment for his mental illness, he wouldn't have had the psychotic break that cut Julia's life so short. I want to make it clear that I'm not grouping all suicidal people together with homicidal people. In the Williams case, he happened to have tendencies toward both. The fact of the matter is, everyone needs and deserves mental health care whether they're dangerous or not. If you've ever had suicidal thoughts, remember, you're not alone. You can always call the National Suicide Prevention Hotline at 1-800-273-8255. Or if you have social anxiety like me or are uncomfortable on the phone, you can text 741741 and someone will get back to you immediately. There are real people out there who want to help you, and their services are completely free and confidential. That's all for this week. If you enjoy the content on our channel, please give me a thumbs up and subscribe. I'll see you next time on Out of the Past.